Part 3. Categorizing Magic Using words to describe magic is like using a screwdriver to cut roast beef. Tom Robbins For as long as magicians have been conjuring, authors have tried to categorize magic tricks. They are generally of three minds. The first dissected magic with the impartial precision of a surgeon. The second has attempted to map the possibilities of magic the way an astronomer charts the constellations, with a mixture of what is possible and what we think might be possible. The third thinks the idea of categorizing magic is pure folly, that one cannot describe illusions the way we describe the anatomy of a frog or the contours of the Mediterranean Sea. The father of modern conjuring, Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, will lead us into this discussion with what I believe to be the first serious attempt to classify modern conjuring effects. He believed there to be six. The Art of Conjuring by Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin To succeed as a conjurer, three things are essential. First, dexterity. Second, dexterity. And third, dexterity. The art of conjuring bases its deceptions upon manual dexterity, mental subtleties, and the surprising results which are produced by the sciences. The physical sciences, generally chemistry, mathematics, and particularly mechanics, electricity, and magnetism, supply potent weapons for the use of the magician. In order to be a first-class conjurer, it is necessary, if not to have studied all these sciences thoroughly, at least to have acquired a general knowledge of them, and to be able to apply some few of their principles as the occasion may arise. The most indispensable requirement, however, for the successful practice of the magic art is great neatness of manipulation combined with special mental acuteness. It is easy enough, no doubt, to play the conjurer without possessing either dexterity or mental ability. It is only necessary to lay in a stock of apparatus of that kind which of itself works the trick. This is what may be called the false bottom school of conjuring. Cleverness at this sort of work is of the same order as that of the musician who produces a tune by turning the handle of a barrel organ. Such performers will never merit the title of skilled artists and can never hope to obtain any real success. The art of conjuring is divided into several branches, namely, Number one, feats of dexterity, requiring much study and persistent practice. The hands and the tongue are the only means used for the production of these illusions. Number two, experiments in natural magic, expedients derived from the sciences and which are worked in combination with feats of dexterity, the combined result constituting conjuring tricks. Number three, mental conjuring, a control acquired over the will of the spectator, secret thoughts read by an ingenious system of diagnosis and sometimes compelled to take a particular direction by certain subtle artifices. This category is the term I coined for the type of effects performed by Monsieur Alfred de Caston. Number four, pretended mesmerism. Imitation of mesmeric phenomena, second sight, clairvoyance, divination, trance, and catalepsy. In 1847, Monsieur Le Saint, the skillful conjurer, performed these type of effects with a rare perfection at the Salle Bonne Nouvelle in Paris. Number five, mediumistic phenomena, spiritualism or pretended evocation of spirits, table-turning, rapping, talking, and writing, mysterious cabinets, etc. 
These mystical effects were presented in 1866 at the Sow Hares by the Davenport Brothers and by the Stacy Brothers at the Théâtre Robert Houdin. And number six. There are in addition very many tricks which cannot be classified as belonging to any special branch of the art. These, which may be described as tricks of parlor magic, rest either on some double meaning, some mere ruse, or on arithmetical combinations which involve a certain key or mode of working, but which do not require any dexterity or special cleverness. These tricks are generally made use of by persons who desire a ready means of exciting surprise and astonishment. I propose to append, at the close of this work, a few of these tricks, which will constitute a special chapter under the title How to Become a Wizard in a Few Minutes. Note, Professor Hoffman pointed out this chapter was not included in the book. Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, Les Secrets de la Magie et de la Prestidigitation, 1868. Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, 1805 to 1871, has given magic as much as any other figure, from the tux, tails, and top hat attire to classic effects like second sight and the light and heavy chest, to the root of the most famous magician of all time, the eye at the end of Houdini. Robert Houdin's most famous contribution to the literature of magic is the following quote. The magician is really an actor playing the part of a magician. Next up is an essay that has fallen into disfavor in the last two decades. In 1944, Dario Fitzky famously attempted to classify all magic tricks into 19 categories. In the book, The Trick Brain, he went so far as to offer a systematic method for creating new effects based more on lists and formulas than on critical thinking. On the whole, The Trick Brain fails because it treats the delicate act of creating magic like painting by numbers. But Fitzky gets credit, at least from me, for his valiant effort to compartmentalize all effects into 19 categories expanding upon previous work of Robert Houdin and S. H. Sharp. I dispute how and where Fitzky divides his list, but you would likely dispute any list I might create as well. You might even reject the notion that classifying effects is useful at all. Tom Stone had these words from me when we discussed the inclusion of the Trick Brain essay. Fitzky went wrong when he reduced all magic to 19 basic effects, because he did it by removing all dramatic and emotional aspects from them. Why stop at 19, by the way? If reductionism is the game, the number could just as easily be 26, 177, or 8. Well, I know very well why he stopped at 19. Because had he continued the reduction, it would have exposed how silly the whole idea was. At the end of any reduction of this kind, there will be only one single basic effect left, which would be something strange happens. Now, try to use that for anything productive. Tom is harsh in his criticism of Fitzky's essay, and his point is well taken, but I believe Tom overlooks one important use for lists of this kind. When I read essays like those sandwiching these words, my thoughts move immediately into problem-solving mode. My mind races, trying to identify effects that might not fit so neatly into these categories. And on the luckiest occasions, I come upon a useful idea. Not all the ideas are in a new category, but they came about by the mere act of trying to think 
outside the list. Sometimes, to create something beyond the borders of what is thought possible, we must know exactly where those borders are. Classification of Effects by Dario Fitzky In Showmanship for Magicians, I took the position that most of the secrets of the tricks we perform are quite simple. I really feel this to be true. Surely, in a world that produces the miracles of modern chemistry, the impossibilities of radio and radar, the genuine and important levitations of modern aeronautics, the black cord elastic which pulls the vanishing handkerchief from sight cannot be seriously considered as something profound or difficult to understand. But a piecemeal dismemberment of each of the thousands of tricks in the repertoire of magic is impossible. It is impossible physically and quite definitely would result in the most gigantic triviality the world has ever witnessed. And it has had some luscious examples, even in my relatively brief time. Far better and much more understandable would be the reduction of these thousands of tricks to a few broad classifications as to effects. In this form, a generalized discussion as to method might become of some practical value. Our undertaking is simplified immediately when we discover that while there are thousands of tricks, there are but few effects. A painstaking survey of a library of magic books and catalogs will show a great variety of individual tricks, but they actually classify into a small group of basic accomplishments. Perhaps it might be well to define just what is meant by the terms trick and effect. Immediately, I must take issue with masculine and devant in their interpretation of the word trick in our magic. They make it clear in that work that they consider trick to mean the secret means of accomplishing a magical effect, the method, not the feat itself. But general usage disputes this view, general usage and even dictionary terms. Trick usually means an individual feat of a magician. It means a particular and individual feat such as the box trick, the needle trick, the ring trick. It not only includes the general ultimate effect, but also the specific identifying objects with which the effect is accomplished. Therefore, throughout this work, I shall use the word trick to mean the individual feat as accomplished with specific objects. On the other hand, where I refer to effect, it must be understood that I mean the more general ultimate accomplishment without any reference to the objects with which it is done. In this way, I shall be referring generally to such objectives as vanishes, penetrations, restorations, and so on. As an example, the trick known as the rod through glass, or clear through, as it was called when Massey first explained it in the initial issue of the Seven Circles, is a penetration effect. The egg bag is a trick. It is a combination effect which includes vanishes, productions, transpositions, and, in some special routines, transformations. The first attempt at a general classification of effects, of which I am aware, was made by T. Page Wright in the May 1924 issue of The Sphinx. Although Mr. Wright's list was a sorting of card tricks to their basic components, whereas the present purpose is to treat with all magic effects generally, it will be of interest, I am certain, as a forerunner of what is to follow in this work. Card Effects Classified by T. Page Wright. Number one, production. Number two, vanish. Number three, transformation. Number four, manipulative. Number five, memorization. Number six, 
guessing problems. Number seven, transposition. Number eight, location and revelation. Number nine, productions from cards as water. Number 10, indestructible card. Number 11, prophetic. Number 12, arranging of cards as spellers, dealing hands, etc. Number 13, naming cards. And number 14, discovery of number selected or moved. Under the heading of transformations, Mr. Wright included changes in the identity of the cards, changes of cards to other objects or the reverse, and changes in the shape or the condition of the card or cards. The manipulative heading included both genuine feats of skill and impossibilities like balancing a card on a table. Several subheads appeared under the Location and Revelation divisions. Some months after the appearance of the right list, I started my own outline. But my list was one covering magic generally and not the card category alone. At that time, my list included 15 divisions which were later increased to include the list appearing later in this work. Later, in 1932, S. A. Sharp included a general list in Neo Magic. This was the first published list to come to my attention, covering magic generally. Mr. Sharp's list follows Analysis of Conjuring Feats by S. H. Sharp. Number 1 Productions From Not Being to Being. Number 2 Disappearances From Being to Not Being. Number three, transformations. From being in this way to being in that. Number four, transpositions. From being here to being there. Number five, natural science laws defied. A, anti-gravity. B, magical animation. C. Magical control. D. Matter through matter. E. Multi position. F. Restoration. G. Invulnerability. And H. Rapid germination. Number six. Mental phenomena. A. Prediction. B. Divination. C. Clairvoyance. D. Telepathy or thought transference. E. Hypnotism. F. Memorization. And G. Lightning calculations. With the eight subdivisions under the general heading of Natural Science Laws Defied and the seven under the Mental Heading, Mr. Sharp's list includes 19 general divisions. Some years ago, while visiting Percy Abbott's plant at Cohen, Michigan, I had a long discussion in this connection with Winston Freer. Later, becoming interested in the subject, Mr. Freer developed his own list independently and published it in The Linking Ring. His list differed materially from the Sharp outline. 17 Fundamental Effects by Winston Freer Number 1. Production Number 2. Vanish Number 3. Change in Position Number 4. Change in Material Number 5. Change in Form Number 6. Change in Color Number 7. Change in size. Number eight. Change in temperature. Number nine. Change in weight. Number ten. Magnetism. Number eleven. 
Levitation. Number 12. Penetration. Number 13. Restoration. Number 14. Remote control. Number 15. Sympathy. Number 16. Divination, comprising all feats of mental magic. And 17. Prediction. In analyzing a matter as complex as this, it is not surprising that there is considerable diversity of opinion as to just what these divisions of general effects should be. So to be consistent, I am submitting here my own list, which again is at variance with those outlined by others. The work of making the necessary research in order to evolve such an outline is tremendous. Literally thousands of tricks, from explanations in magic books to the listings in numerous catalogs, were carefully scrutinized and weighed. After several years' consideration, I am now submitting the outline of basic effects as I have analyzed the problem. While it is possible that some distinctly different effects may have escaped the search, I am firmly convinced that more than 99% of all tricks will fall within these classifications. For that reason, this present list is the one which shall prevail in this book. The 19 Basic Effects Number 1. Production Appearance, Creation, Multiplication Number two, vanish, disappearance, obliteration. Number three, transposition, change in location. Number four, transformation, change in appearance, character, or identity. Number five, penetration, one solid through another. Number six, restoration making the destroyed whole. Number seven, animation, movement imparted to the inanimate. Number eight, anti-gravity, levitation and change in weight. Number nine, attraction, mysterious adhesion. Number 10, sympathetic reaction, sympathetic response. Number 11. Invulnerability. Injury proof. Number 12. Physical anomaly. Contradictions. Abnormalities. Freaks. Number 13. Spectator failure. Magician's challenge. Number 14. Control. Mind over the inanimate. Number 15. Identification. Specific discovery. Number 16. Thought reading. Mental perception. Mind reading. Number 17. Thought transmission. Thought projection and transference. Number 18. Prediction. Foretelling the future. And number 19. Extrasensory perception. Unusual perception other than mind. In looking over this list, it may be noticed that the effects start with physical accomplishments, gradually change to those of mental control, and culminate in a number of divisions which are purely in the realm of mental magic. The first twelve belong to the physical group. The next two following carry a suggestion of mind dominance, and the last five are entirely mental in character. A general explanation of the individual groups might be advisable. Effect number one. Production. The production of a person or an object where nothing appeared before. Something is caused to come into view without apparent clue as to the source. It may be suggested that the above list of effects does not include a separate classification for tricks of inexhaustible supply such as cigarettes from the air or repeated card productions. 
Neither does it include multiplying effects, such as the billiard balls or rapid germination. This was considered, but because effects of inexhaustible supply and multiplication are essentially repetitions of the basic effect of production, appearance, or creation, the cumulative result was discarded as a fundamental. And I believe rapid germination is but another way of saying magical creation, which is what this classification is. It has been the purpose in planning this work to reduce all general accomplishments to their lowest common denominators. Effect number two, vanish. The causing of something to pass from sight by apparently unnatural means. Obviously, this is the reverse of production. The reverse of inexhaustible supply would be, of course, infinite capacity. My research disclosed very few tricks in this category. Viewing multiplication from the position of its reverse, multiple vanish, which is simply a series of vanishes, makes the decision to treat multiplication as a series of productions seem definitely more valid. Effect number three, transposition. Invisible change in location of a person or an object from one place to another. This effect has to do with a change in position. The object might vanish from the hand and reappear upon a nearby table, or it might change place from one cylinder to another. Reasoning basically, of course, the effect actually is a combination of a vanish and a later production elsewhere. Yet I believe the audience views this as a single effect. To the spectator, the basis would be movement. Effect number four, transformation. A person or an object changes identity, color, size, shape, character, etc. Transformations and transpositions are closely allied. In a manner similar to transposition, this division is allied with production and vanish. However, in this classification, the change relates to appearance or character, not to position, as is true of transposition. Effect number five, penetration. The solid matter of one person or object or thing penetrates the solid matter of another person, object, or thing. The penetration, of course, is made apparently without altering the penetrated subject, which should show no place for passage. The penetration may be partial or complete. Effect number six, restoration. The subject of the effect is wholly or partially destroyed and subsequently restored to its original condition. The restored object may or may not carry an identifying mark placed upon it prior to destruction. Effect number seven, animation. An inanimate object is mysteriously endowed with movement. This is the apparent self-movement or supernatural movement of an insensate object. Many of the pseudo-spiritualistic tricks belong in this category. The animation may be done under conditions which would insulate the object from outside assistance, or the insulation may be dispensed with. The animation may be in the form of visible movement, or it may be in the form of a result of unseen movement. Effect number eight, anti-gravity. The person or thing reacts contrary to the laws of gravity. Actually, this effect comes very close in its external appearance to the following effect. Attraction, where magnetic suspension is suggested. Careful consideration led me to conclude that the spectator, however, would view the two effects differently. In one case, the subject would seem to float in air. In the other case, the subject would seem to be suspended by some magnetic light affinity. A suggestion was made that this section be broadened to include any effect which seems to be in defiance of natural law. But in analyzing this situation, I concluded that this would be too broad. 
as the entire repertoire of magic would, or could, come under this heading. It should be borne in mind that this class of effect includes not only those tricks in which something or someone rises and floats, but also those having to do with weight. Thus, the Houdin light and heavy chest would belong here. Effect number nine, attraction. Through some mysterious power, the magician becomes, or causes something or someone else, to become endowed with a power resembling magnetism. This may be a general power of attraction without discrimination as to person or thing. Or it may be selective, being only effective for certain materials or for some definite object. Effect number 10. Sympathetic reaction. A reaction of two or more persons, objects, or persons and objects, showing sympathetic accord in harmony one with the other. Here two or more persons think of or do the same things at the same time, or two disconnected objects may react as if connected, as in the moral wands, or whatever happens to one subject happens also by apparent sympathetic response to the sympathetic subject, as in the sympathetic silks. The many you-do-as-I-do tricks come under this division. Effect number 11. Invulnerability. Demonstrations of resistance or proof against injury. This section includes exhibitions of fire-eating, walking in red-hot coals, walking on swords, lying on beds of spikes, rolling in barrels of broken glass, resistance to poisons and other types of similar ilk. Whatever trick purports to demonstrate any type of invulnerability to forces which would ordinarily destroy the subject should come within this division. Effect number 12. Physical anomaly. Exceptions or contradictions to normal physical rules or reactions. Under this identification come such tricks as walking away from his shadow, the headless woman, the spider, removing the thumb, stretching the neck, and so on. This includes all contradictions, abnormalities and freaks, antimonies, and other incongruities denying natural physical laws. Effect number 13. Spectator failure. This includes all tricks where a spectator is unable to accomplish some apparently simple objective, implying the intervention of some mysterious power of the magician. While it is true that the failure of the spectator may be caused by effects otherwise catalogued, such as vanishes, transpositions, transformations, etc., the essential is that the spectator fails to accomplish something because of an implied inability caused by the performer. Effect number 14. Control. All effects where the mind of the performer seems to dominate whether the subject be animate or inanimate. However, hypnotism, being actually a separate field not normally included in magic, is not included here, as it is the term which usually identifies mental control over a person, although this does not necessarily have to be the case. Many effects, such as certain presentations of the spirit clock, the wrapping hand, and other tricks come under this specialized heading under circumstances where the performer seems to exercise control. Effect number 15. Identification. Here, discovery of an identity, regardless of the method of disclosure, is essential. The discovery of a chosen card, whether it be discovered as the result of a countdown, spelldown, reversal, simple extraction or other method is definitely within this classification. It is particularly important in card work. But discovery may be applied to anything or anyone. Picking out the hidden murderer from amongst the spectators, as in one contact mind-reading routine, may belong to this division, if the emphasis is placed upon the revealing of the identity 
instead of interpreting the mental directions of the transmitter. Also included here are the various so-called divination tricks which depend upon the revelation of a secretly selected colored crayon, tag, pencil, rocket, or other object. This discovery may be made by the performer or by a spectator. Effect number 16, thought reading. In this division, the essential is that the performer apparently reads the thought of another. This should be distinguished from the next classification with emphasis upon the performer taking the thought from another by active effort on his part only. The thought may be written, spoken, or known only to the spectator himself. The performer may disclose his knowledge by writing it, speaking it, or by doing something suggested by the spectator's thought. The disclosure may be made instantly or after the passage of an interval of time. Effect number 17, Thought Transmission The essential is the projection of thought. In the former effect, another's mind is read. In this effect, one person projects his thought to another. At one time I considered including both effects, 16 and 17, under one grouping. But the more I weighed the matter, the more convinced I became that the spectator's interpretation of the two effects is entirely different. Of course, thought transmission need not only include projection from a spectator to a performer. In fact, most demonstrations are similar to that given by the ushers. Here, one performer, working the audience, appears to project his thought to another performer who is on the stage. I do not believe that the spectator gets the impression that Mrs. Usher is reading Mr. Usher's mind. Rather, it seems to me the spectator feels that Mr. Usher is transmitting his thought to Mrs. Usher. Effect number 18. Prediction. This includes all tricks where the future is foretold. Essential is that the performer, or even a spectator, commits himself as to the future behavior of someone else. The prediction may be uttered confidentially to a spectator, or it may be written, or otherwise indicated, in advance. It may have to do with future actions, thoughts, or choices. Effect number 19. Extrasensory Perception this classification is intended to include all types of abnormal perception other than through mental communication. Magic has many effects wherein people or objects are described through seeing with the fingertips, smelling out the identity, feeling the spots on a card, and other apparent impossibilities. Effect number 20. Skill. Not included in list. This is not essentially a magical effect. A sensational demonstration of phenomenal memory conveys an impression of special training. So also do various feats of skill exhibited by performers, such as card jugglery, coin rolls, gambling demonstrations, and such tricks as the eggs and glasses. Even if the trick, and here I mean trick of skill as distinguished from trick of magic, as I started to say, even if the trick is done with some secret apparatus, the impression given to the spectator is nevertheless one of special training, not one of mystery as to the method of accomplishment. By Dario Fitzky, The Trick Brain, 1944 Henning Nelms approaches the topic of what is a trick differently, and attempts only to argue the distinction between a trick and an illusion. Tricks vs. Illusions by Henning Nelms Stage bullet catching is a trick. It makes the audience wonder how it is done, but it does not persuade anyone, even momentarily, that the performer's magic 
renders him invulnerable to rifle fire. Robert Houdin, on the other hand, created an illusion. He persuaded his audience that no bullet could harm him. Unfortunately, conjurers have formed the habit of referring to any large trick as an illusion. The term is used as a description of size. If the equipment is big enough, the trick is called an illusion, even though a ten-year-old child can see right through it. This careless use of language is likely to confuse our thinking. We shall not follow the custom. Instead, we shall call anything a trick which challenges its audience to discover how it was worked. We shall reserve illusion for those feats which actually convince the audience. In most cases, the conviction will be neither deeper nor more lasting than the conviction of an audience at Hamlet that the prince has been killed in a duel. However, this is all the theater needs to create drama, and it is all a conjurer needs to fascinate his audience instead of being content to provide a little amusement. There is a tremendous difference between even such short lived illusions and none at all. If a play fails to create any illusion, it is worthless. On the other hand, if it succeeds in creating an illusion, the fact that the spell of the drama is broken with the fall of the curtain does not diminish its effect in the slightest. Fortunately for conjurers, a routine that fails to create an illusion is better than an unconvincing performance of a play. It may still be highly entertaining as a trick. Nevertheless, as illusions have far more appeal to most audiences, there is no reason why we should not gratify them and ourselves by providing the additional interest. The difference between a trick and an illusion depends largely on the conjurer's attitude. Illusions take many different forms. But in the most typical examples, the performer claims some specific, supernormal power and makes this claim as impressively as possible. He then indicates that the purpose of his performance is to demonstrate the power. He provides this demonstration, and it appears to prove his claim. The conjurer who presents a trick usually begins by admitting that it is a trick. On the rare occasions when he pretends to have some remarkable power, he does it half-heartedly, as though to say, We all know that this is pure hokum, and that I only talk about magic, telepathy, or whatnot, because it is part of the act. Such an attitude cannot create an illusion. If one actor in a play treated his part in this fashion, the play would fail. Furthermore, even when the man who performs a trick does claim a power, he usually leaves it vague. The trick is not treated as a demonstration of the power, and the effect does not prove the claim. He cannot expect to create an illusion, because neither he nor his audience knows what illusion he is trying to create. Henning Nelms, Showmanship for Magicians, 1969 Henning Nelms. Henning Nelms, 1900 to 1986, had a secret pseudonym that he wrote two acclaimed novels under, Hake Talbot. Talbot's Rim of the Pit is considered one of the finest locked room mysteries ever written. Juan Tomares has written much on the theory of magic yet precious little has been translated into the English language. I'm pleased Juan has allowed me to publish this essay in English for the first time. It was written in part for the public, but the information is valuable to the serious student as well. I picked up on a few key details of the piece during translation. For example, when speaking of misdirection, he uses the word deviate as in deviating the spectator's attention. That word says a lot about how he views misdirection itself. He also refers to magic as illusionism, 
and elegantly describes its definition. My favorite sentence is this. Finally, in knowing the function of memory, a magician can create lagoons in the spectator's memories in order to make them forget whatever we wish for the magical effect, or to make them believe they remember things that in reality never existed. The word lagoons is a powerful metaphor for those unperceived glitches in logic that the best magicians create in the minds of their spectators. Fundamentals of Illusionism by Juan Tamariz Illusionism makes visible what isn't really there. This is to say, it coaxes the senses of the spectators, and it is accomplished through natural means. But you know this already. But what isn't as well known is how the magician is using these natural means in order to evoke mystery. It is commonly believed that the magician is a man who possesses great manual and digital dexterity and uses a few special apparatuses. However, the first and most important thing that I have to say is this. The ability of the magician is not the most important thing or even necessary for illusionism, except perhaps in the cases of manipulation acts. The most important thing in magic is talent, magic-specific talent and art. The magical talent is based primarily on three aspects, psychology, creative ingenuity, and personality in presentation. A. Psychology Psychology is, without a doubt, the most essential aspect, and without it, it is practically impossible to be a good magician. I am referring to the knowledge, intuitive and acquired, of the psychological mechanisms of the minds of the spectators, such as knowing in detail what blind spots are present in the spectators' mechanisms of perception, attention, and memory. This psychology also allows us to know when it is possible to achieve an illusion within their senses and make them perceive things that are not really happening. We must study how our words and actions oscillate the attention of the spectator, using these moments where their attention is minimal to do the deceptive movement. In knowing how to manipulate people's minds, in the good sense, of course, let's leave aside politics and propaganda, of the spectator in order to provoke drops in their attention at precise moments of a trick. This psychology allows us to deviate, physically or psychologically, their attention from the place where the secret technique will take place, or from the idea that could lead them to knowledge of such techniques. Finally, in knowing the function of memory, a magician can create lagoons in the spectator's memories in order to make them forget whatever we wish for the magical effect or to make them believe they remember things that in reality never existed. Since all of this is somewhat abstract, let's look at some examples. 1. In order to lower their attention, the magician makes a handkerchief disappear, and now he is going to make it reappear. For this, he needs a Secret, slight. The attention of the spectators is focused at this moment. The magician, once he has finished the disappearance, shows his hands empty, relaxes his body, and begins to bow. The audience believes the trick has ended, and they also relax their attention and applaud. The magician takes advantage of this low attention. He takes hold of a handkerchief and keeps it palmed in his hand, and suddenly looks toward the empty space to his left. The attention builds once again, while the magician pretends to pull the handkerchief from the air, secretly producing it from his palm. I believe the difference is clear between this technique, used by a deft magician, and the mythical ability many people ascribe to him. It is not about doing something quickly. 
the hand is quicker than the eye, or with great expertise, but in creating a convenient psychological process. 2. In order to deviate the attention, misdirection. A magician has made a red ball disappear and is now going to make it reappear. He needs to do a secret movement. The magician asks the spectators, You all remember the size and color of the ball? The spectators, who had their attention focused on the movements of the magician, continue to look at him, but their mind and their attention is now divided. In one part, they watch the hands of the magician, but the other is thinking of the little red ball. The magician executes the secret move, causing it to appear between his fingers as he says, It was like this, right? And three, memory. The magician gives an envelope to a spectator in order to have it examined. He hands the spectator a deck of cards to shuffle and also a pencil to sign the envelope with. While the spectator is signing the envelope with the pencil, the magician, in order to help him, takes back the deck of cards from the spectator's hands. Immediately after signing the envelope, the magician returns the cards to the spectator. The magician takes one or two steps back and requests the spectator to take the top card of the deck and to place it inside the envelope. At the end of the trick, the freely chosen card inside the envelope matches a prediction made by the magician before the trick began. The secret lies in the magician adding a card, secretly, to the top of the deck when he was holding the deck to help the spectator. We are not trying in this example to see the best way of masking the addition of this card, but rather in knowing how to make the spectator forget that the magician touched the deck after the spectator himself shuffled. This is to say, to make him believe the selection of the card, the top card of the shuffled deck, was freely chosen, or even better, based on chance. With this one memory erased, the effect of the prediction will be truly incomprehensible. After all, after a certain elapsed time and a few ups and downs, such as hanging the envelope on a thread in order to isolate it, etc., the magician says, You examined the envelope, shuffled the deck, and placed a card inside the envelope, which you signed yourself. This means that the card was freely chosen, without the possibility of it being switched by any manipulation on my part, since I have been distanced at all times from it. Surely after this, the spectators will forget that the magician held the deck of cards for a few seconds. Note that this is a simple example of the principle discussed, and is for illustration only. B. Creative Ingenuity and Technical Ability Creative ingenuity is important for creating new effects. To invent new techniques, slights, manipulations, and sequences, as well as to design new apparatuses. Creative ingenuity is what characterizes the original magician. He is the one who presents personal effects, the one who constantly surprises, the one who is able to mystify even the most suspicious spectators from know-it-alls to the uninitiated. He is, in the end, what advances illusionism. Technical and manipulative ability is, in some tricks, and only in some, important. In any case, I point out once more that it is not necessary, by any means, to possess special gifts of ability to be a good magician. Do not fear reader who wishes to enter illusionism, the supposed or real lack of ability, if you have ability with your hands, fantastic. But if you do not, it doesn't matter. Only a few tricks will be out of your reach, but a great majority of the tricks are accessible to the person with normal or medium ability. 
think of magicians like Argentina's René Levan, who is an excellent magician with only one hand. And C. Presentation and Personality A magician must present the effects he presents well. By well, I mean that he must present the tricks appropriately, mentally, comically, visually, to the type of spectators that he has in front of him, an adult audience, children, the level of culture that the audience has, to the type of frame where you perform in, a theater, a banquet hall, television, a parlor, a house, to the circumstances of the event, in a professional setting, a children's party, a sanatorium, at a table amongst friends, and finally, with a proper presentation for his personality. It is not necessary that the magician be elegant, nor tall, nor good-looking. It is not necessary to be fun or dynamic. There are infinite varieties of presentation, but often only one is ideal for the personality of each magician. The magician must base the trick he or she presents on his own personality type. If you have natural charisma, a presentation that is more sympathetic, friendly, and peppered with jokes and gags will do well. If you don't have this kind of personality, it will be absurd to portray yourself as a showman. Instead, perhaps you will be a magnificent magician with a pseudo-scientific presentation or enigmatic. Unfortunately, we often see magicians who look alike and perform with a persona that doesn't fit. As a consequence, they don't manage to connect with their spectators. In conclusion, it is easy to see how magicians make the magical emotion truly felt by their spectators. They use psychology to hide, creativity to be original, and an appropriate presentation to their personality in order to transmit that little work of art that is, after all, mysterious, incomprehensible, and a beautiful magical effect. Juan Tamariz, Secretos de Magia Potagia, 1973 Juan Tamariz Juan Tamariz has been called the greatest living magician. He has astounded Spanish and international audiences on television, in large theaters, and up close. He has influenced a generation of magicians with his style, writings, and performance.